We were leftists once. We thought we had all the answers. Capitalism is bad, that's an answer. Conservatives are liars, that's an answer. And then the sickness came, and we started to run out of answers. How could we possibly persuade the world that science was on their side when the lies were so prolific and the recovery so painfully slow? We faltered. The gaps between videos grew longer and longer. Bread tube might have saved us, but for one foolish non-binary content creator, this is that story. Oh, baby, it's a beautiful day for a leftist essay. Good morning, script. Good morning, undisclosed location in rural Ireland. And good morning to my brand new perfect chopping board. Oh, you're such a good chopping board. We're gonna chop so many things, and nobody's gonna make fun of our chopping style. No, they're not gonna make fun of us at all. Hi, I'm Neil, and I'm a liberal cook. And today's episode is all about those wacky anti vaxxers <gasps> You don't want to make that essay. I... Hello. We need to make a different video. Are you? Yes. I'm you. Thirsty or anything? Did you want a cup of tea? There's no time. No time for tea. No time for jokes. No time for green screen. Not anymore. No time for baths. Don't you understand what I'm saying? I've been through everything you're about to go through. So much pain. So much promise wasted. And all because it's easier to make fun of science deniers and conservatives than it is to do what it is you're supposed to do. And what is it I'm supposed to do? Teach everyone in the world how to understand academic papers. But that's impossible. Yes. And that's why I'm going to do it. What? What, what, what am I going to do while you're doing that? Well. You won't be having a bath anyway. You're going to travel into the future. There you will see what I have seen, God help you. You will speak to the secretary. And if we're lucky, you will finally get to meet the person with the answers. And who's that? I can't be sure, but some call them the clown lib. But, but, but I was gonna make a vegan lasagna. There's no time for vegan lasagna. Here, take these. You'll need the sodium. Let's just say that you really are telling the truth. Let's just say that you're from the future and, 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 and let's just... Got it. You I sound, sound like Ben Shapiro. Shapiro. Believe me now. Excellent. Excellent! What would have happened if I'd made the video essay about anti-vaxxers? Let's just say the Lindsay Ellis video about how much of an idiot you are got 20 million views. Well, okay, then... <gasps> Okay, so first of all, what is research? All right, this time there's no messing about. We need to learn this now. Let's say there's something that you need to find out about the world. How do you go about that? How do you currently conduct your research? And be honest, because the fate of the world is depending on us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let's say a friend of yours says something like, yeah, didn't you know coconut oil is a superfood? So you look it up on Google because you're no gullible Gary and you see the first result is from a website that's been routinely criticized for putting out misinformation. And it says coconut oil gets called a superfood. Doesn't mention that superfood is a marketing term which has no scientific basis, by which I mean, <sighs> let me be real careful here, eat whatever you want. But the word superfood is a neologism and it's used to sell food and diets. It's not a scientific term. Please limit comments in my comment section to 5,000 words or less. And that's just someone writing something down. You remember when you were in school and someone would graffiti your desk with Neil is a bag or whatever. The act of writing something down doesn't make it 
true, not on a classroom desk or in www.thevaccine forward slash is a hoax dot truth and not in the Daily Mail. And while there are plenty of good newspapers and good news sources and the Daily Mail that might report on a study from a real scientific journal, just because something's been written down doesn't make it true. So the first part of Google is dominated by a scammy website. But what if you know to avoid that? What if you look further and you turn to editorials and expert opinion? Well, that kind of evidence, it can be good, it can be tricky. How do you define an expert, for example? What field are they an expert in? Where does their expertise interact with their feelings about a thing? Richard Dawkins says, religion is a mental illness. But we're not persuaded by that because Dawkins is an expert on mental illness. He's not. We're persuaded by his plummy accent, his powerful poetic metaphors, and of course the fact that we already agreed with him before he had even begun to speak. Besides, that's not the sort of evidence that an academic can cite in order to prove any kind of point, but it is the sort of evidence that some friend of yours can use to justify their Islamophobia. But you can turn to more reputable sources, somewhere like the BBC or NPR or the New York Times. They hire health writers with credentials. And if you look here, does coconut oil deserve its health halo? You can see no, at least according to this journalist who interviews experts all saying that the health effects are mostly marketing. So there you go. That should cover most of your questions. Go to one of the big reputable sources and you should have a pretty good idea. But what if you want to go further? What if you want to do your research? Because we're still talking about secondary sources, people looking at the research and explaining it to you. What if you want to look at primary sources, at the research itself? Well, you can tab over to Google Scholar and search through the scientific literature. You might find your way to a 2020 systematic review entitled Effect of Coconut Oil on Cardiometabolic Risk, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Interventional Studies. When compared to corn, palm, soybean and safflower oil, coconut oil increased people's total cholesterol and LDL, bad cholesterol, but when compared with butter, it raised HDL, good cholesterol, and decreased LDL, bad cholesterol. Which means, uh, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Maybe you don't know what that means. But don't worry, you're gonna find out. We're gonna figure it out. We're gonna save the world. Let's go through types of evidence because that matters. So that study, this meta-analytic systematic review of interventional studies, that's like the highest quality of research you can do. So let's start at the start and work our way up to it. Let's do our research. Think of evidence as like a pyramid. What the f Sorry, it's a bad marker and it's a bad pyramid. Think of evidence like a pyramid. I'm gonna have to do. And at the bottom of the pyramid, you have cross-sectional studies. But what is a cross-sectional study? And why is it here on the pyramid? And why are the other layers above it deemed to have a greater strength of evidence? And why am I shouting at you? So cross-sectional studies are studies that happen at one point in time. They can be surveys, they can collect health readings. The point is they just happen once and they're really useful for something that requires a snapshot in time. So prevalent studies studies which show how common certain disorders are within a population are often cross-sectional. So we'll call people up and say, do you have diabetes? Or we'll give them a questionnaire like the PCL, which measures post-traumatic stress disorder. And then we can say that X percentage of the people within a population are over the threshold for PTSD, or X percentage of the people in a population report eating coconuts within the last week. And you can measure two things at once, see links, correlations, for made up examples, you may find that a high level of PTSD symptoms corresponds with a high level of self-reported coconut consumption, or there is an association between higher enjoyment of the works of Andrew Lloyd Webber and increased ownership of exotic hats. This is where we get that phrase, correlation is not causation. It doesn't mean that the research is sloppy, 
People aren't just rocking up to their friend Agnes and saying, oh, that's a fancy sombrero, Agnes, and a lot of posters for Starlight Express. Scientists use statistics to determine appropriate sample sizes or to map just how linked two things are. There's a standard cutoff for uncertainty, it's called a p-value, and it's set at 0.05. And what that means is that researchers will only say that things are significantly linked if the stats say that we're 95% sure that they are. This is where we get that the results were significant. It doesn't just mean the link was real big, but because cross-sectional studies involve samples that are taken just once, we can't really say how the things are linked. We can't definitively say that one is causing the other. So why do people run these kinds of studies? Well, they're useful for certain things. This percentage of the population identifies as this thing, or feels this thing, or reports suffering from this disorder, or eating this thing. That can affect policy or budgets. There are useful questions that these sorts of studies can examine. And they can be first steps to the other kind of study, longitudinal studies, or studies that take place over time. Because by comparison, cross-sectional studies are less intensive and they're cheaper. Besides, it would be a real waste of resources to run a multi-year intensive RCT, having people learn more and more lines from Phantom whilst discreetly measuring their resultant accumulation of hats. The Phantom of the Opera is there in your beret. Look, I can't actually teach you how to read the stats of a cross-sectional study, and I don't think I need to teach you how to read the abstract. But if you can have a look at it, recognize that it is a cross-sectional study, see that it's a snapshot in time, then maybe you can say to yourself, oh, this media outlet or this YouTuber or my friend Agnes has misrepresented this data. And wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be a start? It's getting us all to know that we can do our research. We need to figure out how to get out of this false information war before it's too late. Identify yourself. I, I'm Neil. I, I'm the liberal cook. I mean, I'm a YouTuber from the year 2021. I, I was sent here to... That is just the liberal communist plan. Fire G is the villains. You must be lost. You must be lost. You must be lost. You must be lost. You So on to longitudinal data, or data over time. I might point out here that we're focusing on epidemiology, or the study of health stuff. Why? Because that seems to be the area where people are screaming the loudest, do your research, but also because it happens to be the field of study of one of the people behind the channel. How convenient. So I'm not going to teach you how to read a physics paper, but I am going to teach you about longitudinal data. This can be split into two groups, case control and cohort. These kind of studies take place over time, and because of that, we can try to see how two factors interact with each other. Essentially, we're trying to show how one thing can lead to another. These factors can be called X and Y, or exposure and outcome, but to oversimplify, we're trying to demonstrate a cause and effect relationship helpful for scientific inquiry, right? Case control studies, that's when you pick your subjects based on their caseness or outcome. So you pick your subjects based on whether they do or do not have a disorder. Whereas cohort studies, that's where you pick your subjects based on their exposure, whether they did or did not experience a thing. And so they have a different relationship to time often. Case control studies often move backwards in time. So you pick your subjects based on whether they do or do not have a disorder, and then you go back in time to see, did they experience a hypothesized cause? 
Whereas cohort studies, well, they move forward in time. So you pick your subjects based on whether they did or did not experience a cause and then move forward in time to see if they experience a hypothesized disorder. Now, both kinds of studies need a control group, a group to compare with. Because if we're dealing with cohort studies and we're trying to establish if experiencing X leads to developing Y, then we need a group to compare with that didn't experience X. Or in the case of case control, we need a group that didn't develop Y. Like if our hypothesis is that watching Zack Snyder's Justice League leads to death, then we can't just follow people who watched all four hours of the DCEU ZSJL and then note that after a period of time, often a lifetime, all participants died. Well, we could do that, but we couldn't then conclude that our hypothesis was correct. No, we need to compare them with a group of hardcore Marvel fans who will never watch Zack Snyder's Justice League, but who will, all of them, die. You'll notice that cohort studies are higher on the pyramid. Well done for noticing that. And that's because they offer better evidence. Cohort studies go forward in time, so they're less prone to bias. Looking back can be less reliable. Recall bias, for example, can be pretty high in case controls. Think of a morning where you woke up with a pain in your tummy. Oh, what's the, I got a pain in my tummy. Why am I a pain in my tummy? And then you think, could it have been that four liter pot of Gobi Alu I ate all to myself? Or was it the six pints of hot chocolate? Or was it that first sharing bag of extra spicy crisps? Maybe it was the second sharing bag of extra spicy crisps. You might go through a whole list of all the things from the previous day, bit by bit, until you decide what made your stomach hurt. No, it was that blueberry I ate. Now compare that to the, all the mornings where you've woken up after consuming four liters of Gobi Alu and six pints of hot chocolate and two sharing bags of extra spicy crisps and a blueberry and felt absolutely fine because you're a gosh darn animal and I love you. Well, that's all very silly, but the point is if a researcher asks two different people what they ate one day of last week, then the person with the tummy pain is more likely to remember than the person who didn't experience any pain and didn't review everything that they ate last week. I mean, maybe they're mixing up a few different days from their week, right? Well, it's called recall bias, and it means that someone with an illness is more likely to remember an exposure than someone in a control group or they're more likely to exaggerate an exposure than someone in a control group. It isn't nefarious or intentionally misleading, it's just how memory works. So why use case controls at all? They're awful. No, primarily they're useful for rare conditions. Schizophrenia, for example, has a point prevalence of 4.6 out of 1,000. That means that if you're trying to establish what causes schizophrenia, then you'd have to recruit 1,000 participants and follow them through time. And even then, only five or so would ever develop the disorder. And five is just too small of a number to do any kind of analysis. If you wanted to get to 100 participants with schizophrenia, you'd have to recruit 20,000 people and follow them through time, something which no research center has the budget or organizational ability to do. Unless... I got to 20,000 subscribers and we did it all unethically. No, I'm joking. No Dr. Zimbardo stuff in this channel. The point is, if you wanted to establish whether or not childhood adversity uh, impacted developing schizophrenia later in life, then you're probably better off speaking to a hundred participants with schizophrenia and asking them about their childhood and then comparing that to a hundred people without schizophrenia who you've asked about their childhood. Yes, the risk of bias has gone way up because we're talking to people about their childhood, but the study itself has become possible. So cohort studies, this, this guy, keep up, <laughs> They're useful for more common conditions or for situations where there's a number of possible outcomes. And they often, though not always, move forward in time. You're trying to measure whether experiencing X thing leads to Y outcome or W outcome or Omicron outcome. Like, does owning a cat lead to having awesome hair? Yeah. Uh, so you'd go to a cat shelter and you'd uh, find people getting their first cat and ask them to fill out part one of your survey and measure their hair awesomeness with your hair measuring devices. And then you'd have to recruit a control group, people without cats, uh, of a similar background and then measure their hair awesomeness and then follow everyone through 
time, okay? And then maybe at the six week time point, everyone has around about the same level of hair awesomeness, a sort of Helen Mirren level of awesome hair, but maybe at month six, the cat group has more awesome hair than the control group, a sort of Lupita Nyong'o level on the hair awesomeness scale. Or maybe there'd be no difference at all and you'll really have to justify why this was a good research project idea to your supervisor. There is no hair awesomeness scale, taste is subjective, go to bed. One of the points we could make here is that although there is less bias in the cohort studies than in the case controls, bias can still creep in. Like if you as the researcher really, really want the hypothesis to be true, I mean, wouldn't it be cool, then you might tip the data one way or the other. You might measure the hair as more awesome than you should. It isn't intentional, but it can happen. A way to fix this is to blind the study, which here would be to hide from the people collecting the data whether or not any one person has a cat. There are a few ways to do this, like having a different person recruit than the person taking the measurements, so that the measurement taker has no idea who's in what group and just has to rate the hair independently. Bias happens. But it's very specific and nuanced and finickety the way it plays out. And we put measures in the methodology to combat bias as best we can. Not specific biases, not conservative bias or a pre-existing belief in the healing power of dandelions, but all biases. Any and all human interactions with the process, encumbered as they are by frail human beliefs and desires and feelings and prejudices are at least given a chance of being weeded out of the data. And even then, the idea is that this inevitable noise and bias of grubby human interaction is kept in mind as we interpret the data. That's how it works. Do your research. Do your research. Any idea where I should be going? How I get back? Find the clown lib. Yeah, that's what the other me said. I don't know what that means though, do I? Telephone. Telephone. What? You realize I'm having a panic attack right now? Marxist identified. Hand over all copies of 1984. <sighs> Stand by for extermination. Do your research. Remember what your therapist said? Remember, Neil, when you begin to panic, five things you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can touch, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Tastes like victory. hold really quick we're like super super busy i'm so so sorry wait what okay so next we have or cts or randomized control trials. An RCT is very similar to a cohort study, except we're experimenting rather than 
observing. It's probably the kind of study you're most familiar with. Want to see if a new drug works? Run an RCT, give half the people the drug and half the people the placebo and see who has fewer symptoms after an hour. This is the top of the single source research pyramid. It offers the most compelling kind of evidence. We give people the drug rather than rely on self-report or on recall and we can blind people as to what group they're in. Now obviously we can't use an RCT for everything. If we think that X thing is likely to lead to Y disorder then it would be unethical to make people do X thing like watching an Andrew Lloyd Webber. That's where we rely on natural experiments, observational studies like cohorts and case controls. But if we want to see if a new depression drug works or if a new vaccine works, that's where we use RCTs. And where cohort studies can be blinded, RCTs can often be double blinded. With a drug, for example, we can make it so that neither the researcher nor the subjects know whether they're in the experimental group or the control group. We put drug 857 in someone's arm and then a computer keeps track of whether or not it's the placebo and then only at the end when the data is analyzed do we know whether or not it was the placebo and whether or not it worked. One day I'd like to try conducting a quadruple blind test where no one knows anything about anything. Oh wait, that's the government. One last, thing, well, one last thing to look out for across all studies, be that RCT, cohort, case control, or cross-sectional, is confounding. Confounding is, very simply, when two things look like they're linked, but their linkage is actually explained by a third thing. For example, let's say I wanted to find out if grey hair leads to imminent death. Well, I run a cohort study and find that people with more grey hairs are likelier to die within five years. All of my statistical tests and bias assessments come back negative. This is a true fact, except it's not. It's not causal. My data is confounded by age. A confounder like age is linked to both the X and Y variables and actually explains the interaction. Increased age leads to increased chance of death. Increased age also leads to increased gray hairs, but gray hairs aren't actually linked to an increased chance of death. They're linked to an increased chance of wielding magic. Confounders are, well, they're the scariest thing to researchers because there is no statistical test for if data is confounded. You just have to know what the confounders are and control for them in selection or statistically. And when there is a confounder that you don't know about, it can lead you to make incorrect links. Only as theories and evidence grow do researchers become more aware of confounders and are less likely to put out confounded research findings. Are you starting to see yet how hard it is to find the causes of things? Would you give science a chance, you wacky meat-headed numpty? Okay, now we've scaled all the way to the top of the pyramid and we have systematic reviews and, God, <laughs> meta, analyses. Everything we've done up until this point has been based on single studies, but these are essentially collections of studies. That's why they're at the top of the pyramid. A systematic review is a comprehensive literature search where someone asks a question. Does eating coconut oil impact cholesterol? And searches for, reads, synthesizes and analyzes every single peer-reviewed study on the topic. Meta-analyses go one step further and take all the numbers from all the different studies in order to run one massive analysis with a massive sample size. Now, these come in different shapes and sizes too. Uh, if you're running a systematic review of just case controls, it's going to be less persuasive, less impressive, and more prone to bias than if you're running a systematic review of just cohort studies or RCTs or double-blind RCTs. But they're incredibly persuasive because while an individual study has that 5% chance of being a fluke, a systematic review of 8 studies or 10 studies or 30 studies offers a more comprehensive result. It's the best possible answer to do we think X causes Y? So if you go to Google Scholar and you type in coconut oil health systematic review, you might find Effect of Coconut Oil on Cardiometabolic Risk, a systematic review and meta-analysis of interventional studies. Hey, it's our old friend! The 2020 systematic review of all the experimental RCT studies done on coconut oil. It's the review we mentioned at the start. 
the one that found that in 20 scientific studies on the subject, coconut oil increased bad cholesterol when compared to vegetable oil, but not when compared to controls of butter. It's, it's very good evidence whether coconut oil is healthy or not, and it's free for anyone to access. You just have to know what it is and where to look. Link in the description, why not? And there is something particularly cool about systematic reviews and a caveat that I should add about the other kinds of studies because this whole time I've been saying do your research and what I really mean is read your research. I don't mean go knocking on doors and start to run a psychology experiment because you can't and shouldn't run an experiment on living beings not without serious oversight. If you want to run a study on human behavior or a medical intervention, you both legally and ethically need to be associated with an institution with an ethics board or IRB to approve your study and make sure you're not going to cause any harm. Because health researchers have done some truly deplorable things in the name of science and even the best of intentions won't mean that you won't cause harm without oversight. Insert second Dr. Zimbardo joke of the video here. Besides, there's probably lots of tricky things you haven't thought of like how to get your participants to give informed consent or how to store data securely or how to help a participant if they go into crisis. So please, please don't think about doing any of the studies I've mentioned yourself. Unless... Unless, seriously, unless you want to do a systematic review or a meta-analysis because truly anyone can do one of those. It's fully ethical. You're working with previously published data and as long as you follow the guidelines, check out Prisma or Cochrane if you want the real details, I'll link below, then you can even get it published if you want. You can contribute to the scientific record and you can not just do your research by reading the literature, you can literally do the research. Novel, important, publishable research. We could make a broader point here too about gatekeeping and about how all knowledge should be made available to the public. We could point out how it costs researchers money to make their findings publicly available. But if you email them, by the way, and ask for a copy of their paper, their uh, publisher can't stop them and they'd probably be more than happy to help. We could point out how capitalism and patents and prestige make commodities of advancements and, and gatekeep knowledge and worse, obfuscate the scientific method. So people are just like, oh, when it comes to how we know things or why we should trust them or believe them. We could say all of that and it's all very valid, but that's not a critique of the scientific method. It's a critique of the way we make money out of it. Funders may not fund what doesn't have a bottom line. Philanthropists may only fund what's trendy or what has a good PR team, but the researchers on the ground, ethics dodgers and bad faith actors aside, well, they're mostly working for free, just trying to make the world a better place. Pick one and send them a friendly email about their area of study. Do your research. Are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Yes. What do you want? Uh, I, I don't exactly know. I, I, I think I'm supposed to speak to the clown lib. The clown lib. Yes. Apparently. Is really who you want to talk to? Uh, yes. You think? Yes. One moment, please. Oh, wait, no, no. Five things you can see. Six things you could lick. Four things. You are about to be transferred to the clown lid. Stand by for teleportation. Hey, yes, hey, yes. Oh, and make sure you have a really, really, really nice day. Thank you so much for calling. Just please call again anytime. Really, it's not going to be a bother to me at all. I don't understand. It, it, it's me again, you again. Funny how it works out, isn't it? Hello, old blue friend. Tell me, did we ever make that video about polyamory? <laughs> I thought you'd say that. Uh, excuse me, but- Why are you here? <laughs> well, tell me, 
Why did you set out to make a video about anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists? Hmm? Because... because they're putting people's lives in danger. And I'm sick of science denial. Did you think you'd change their minds? Uh... I don't know. Did you set out to teach your audience anything about science denial? We're not the ones who need more understanding. Ah, but you are the ones capable of it. This is why they call you the clown lib? And you, the liberal cook. You could have been the best of us. But instead you turned into me. All because you were too busy showing off. Never admitting when you were wrong. I admit when I'm wrong all the time. So defensive. I am not defensive. Look, this isn't about me. Oh, but this is absolutely about you. This is about what you don't know and what you choose to do about it. The future is not set. You can change the world. We can change the world. Surrender your sureness and your arrogance and your fragility. Let go of my anger? No, keep the anger. If anything, you could use more anger. Learn angrily. Teach angrily. Be braver. And admit when you're wrong. Admit what you don't know and turn that not knowing into questions. Questions can be answered. Hubris is just a weight around your neck. I don't understand what this has to do with research. Well, then let's do a study. Take out the crisps. The, the... Take them out! Hey, jeez. This study is simply how many crisps are in the bag. One, two, three... Well, that's half a crisp, three and a half. Is it? What's half a crisp? I'm counting this one as two. Bold decision by the researcher. <laughs> Whoopsie toodles! Jeez, I don't know. Uh, uh, 10, 11, 12 and a half. This is ridiculous, it's dust! I and yet you must count. And the crisps, or chips if you like, defy you at every turn. This is data, Neil. Even with something simple, a cross-sectional study. How many crisps in the bag? You still have to make decisions. Is this one a crisp? Is this large one too? And so on. And these are just crisps. Imagine when it's people. Imagine how culture and unexamined judgments can influence. What? 22? Count. 24? 24? 17? Dear friend, you have taught me the data and research are far more complex than I thought. I now understand that those that dedicate their lives to medicine and education are true heroes, and that it is indeed capitalism that is our mutual foe. I must go now, to protect the vulnerable, destroy systems of oppression and save small furry animals from oncoming traffic. Goodbye Neil Farrell, I will always love you. Okay. Alright. That's enough liberal cook stuff for today. So that's it. That's the video. That's enough of, enough of that. And uh, yeah, so there's my Patreons. There's um, Flatulent Jiggly Kitten and um, <laughs> Disregulated and Floof Pants. And uh, there's, there's all of them over there and you could be a patreon too i mean like real talk uh i'm still working uh, in like like a real job like this is very hard work but i work in a job where i'm not out and i hate it i hate it and i want to be out 
in my life. And um, I'm not playing the world's smallest violin. I hope that you were entertained, but um, I'm looking for help because uh, I want to just do this. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to work in a shop, like pretending to be a man and being told like, good man, good man, good boy. It's like, it's real dumb. So if you can, support me on Patreon. And if you can't, like, subscribe, share the videos, tell all your friends. If you're here and you're at the end of the video and you're having a good time, like, brilliant. That's good enough. Leave comments, be kind, be nice to me. Let's just all be nice and real with each other. I had a good time making this one. I want to make more. And uh, you're all fantastic. I have like the best comment section in the world. Now I'm just ranting. But uh, that was my video. Anyway, the next one's about Polly. There you go. There's no like to be continued this Polly. That was what we were doing. Are you disappointed? It's not police brutality. I'm not doing a police brutality episode. Polly Amory. Yeah. Way, way less controversial. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. All right. Bye.